I don't have any reason to swear today because we're going to do a big summary of everything that we've been talking about. And I know that those of you, this is really loud and I love it. <laughs> those of you who have been here over the last few times that I've taught have been very, very bored with the English somewhat quasi-critical reading that we're doing of Genesis right now. It's okay, I'm just joking. Um, it, it, it should be a bit mundane, because when it's a mundane, that's a good key that you're not afraid of it anymore. So that's, that's a good thing. But meaning, like, once things begin to progress toward that, then we're starting to look at them enough that we've read it enough that we know what it has to say. Okay, and so if the Bible surprises you, read it more. You know, read it more frequently so that you're not surprised when something happens. Like, oh, I didn't know that that happened. Well, you should. You know, nothing should catch you off guard in the stories as far as you should know that it's there. How to deal with that? <laughs> That's another thing altogether and partially where I come in, at least for some of it. And so... What we've been doing is going from chapter to chapter and reading the English version of the Hebrew Bible somewhat critically. And what I mean in that is we haven't been doing a lot of Hebrew grammar, so we can't really say critically. <laughs> um, that kind of stuff, I think, is better reserved for when we can be more interactive and, and really dig down deep. So we're going to do that in the future. We're going to have some home-type groups where we actually learn how to read this stuff and really focus on issues of grammar and issues... Uh, because, you know, there are issues of grammar that can upset a lot of the doctrines that we believe that we've created to defend what we think God looks like in the Hebrew Bible. You know, and the one, I'll give it away because we won't be in Leviticus for a while going through this, but the one that we, we kind of touched on in my podcast with Daniel is that Leviticus doesn't begin with a command to sacrifice. Okay, people, why did God command the sacrifices? Well, Leviticus does not begin with a command to sacrifice. Okay, it begins with a word that in Hebrew can be translated as when or if. So it's saying, hey, if you're going to sacrifice, here's how I would like you to do it. It doesn't say do it. What, it's, what, it, what it really is, is, I mean, if we're going to look at it as something more than just a piece of, of parchment from a long time ago, what it really is, is it's God saying, you're going to do this anyways, so here, let me tell you how to do it right. Okay, and he never once commands it. And, and this is just a matter of grammar. And we don't need to create these big doctrines that Jesus hated Judaism. Like, Jesus is a Jew. How dumb. <laughs> You know, we don't need to create those doctrines because it's right there in the text, and it's fine. And no one that reads Hebrew would think anything other than when or if when they see that. It's just in the English that we're like, oh no, God's commanding it. You know, the when is a, it's a, it's when you sacrifice because you're gonna. No, it's when or if. <laughs> and that's fine. Okay, but we're not there yet, and a lot of you probably won't be here by the time we get to Leviticus. I don't mean that in a morbid way. I No, I really mean that as in, like, on any given Sunday, only three people that have ever seen each other in this church ever show up together. <laughs> we kind of have, like, a, a which group is going to be here this week? I cleaned that one up well. Um, but we're in Genesis, and so don't hold me to what I just said, and I'll edit it off the video. So Genesis 1 to 11 is where we have been, and... We'll read Genesis 11 at the end today instead of reading it at the beginning and trying to do a critical reading of it right away. Okay, so I just want to get into the meat of what we're doing. Genesis 1 to 11 is a literary unit, okay? And this is kind of hard sometimes for people to wrap their brains around. The current books of the Bible as we have them are not so neatly organized in the ancient world. Okay, most of what we have today is based in things that are like the, the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, just makes some changes to things and categorizes things. And, it, it, and even along the way, the rabbis did it too. They begin to add to, right? But the idea is that Genesis is not a book. It is a collection of stories. 
Okay, and so then the Bible itself is also not a book. It is a collection of books. Okay, and so, I mean, I don't think that should be too groundbreaking for any of us. But even within those books, there's some things that need to be segregated out as literary units. Okay, and Genesis 1 to 11 is one that virtually every scholar I've ever read, even the most conservative of scholars, acknowledges that this is a separate literary unit from Genesis 12 to 36? Yeah, and 37 to 50. Okay, they're different pieces of writing. And what is 1 to 11 is typically referred to as is the primeval history. Okay? And so that primeval means this is before known time. Okay? Prehistory. Pre-written history. And so all that we have are stories. Okay? And 1 to 11 is the primeval history. And whether that's the primeval history of humanity or the primeval history of Israel will come to light in a little bit. Okay, so in this primeval history, primeval story, we have several tales, I guess, is the best way to to put it. Pieces of folklore might work. Also myths, but we don't like the word myth because we don't, myth is story in the ancient world and it doesn't mean fake. You know, today we're arrogant and so we call anything that isn't our religion mythology, right? But our own religion is even mythology because it has to do with deities and how they become and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, in the classical definition of mythology, Christianity is a mythology, okay? And there's going to be someone that's going to say, well, actually, and that's fine, and yes, we can nuance that, but let's just, let's just open it up to what we're talking about, okay? Myth doesn't mean fake or fiction, Um, Anyways, these stories, they look and they smell and they taste (laughs) and they sound an awful lot like their ancient Near Eastern counterparts. And the problem is, is that a lot of us, when we hear the word ancient Near Eastern counterpart, we're like, what are you talking about? Because we've never been told that there are other documents that we have, that I have in my library on my computer that are written by other cultures that surrounded Israel. And some of these documents confirm things that Israel said, And some of them stand in the face of what Israel said and are actually more verifiable than the documents of Israel. Okay, and so some of this, like, this is where we begin to be protected from things a lot of times. We've never been exposed to other ancient Near Eastern texts that relate to what the Bible's talking about. And so what we think is that the Bible's attempting to just tell us how about, oh, well, God did this and God did that and God did this and God did that. And that's not what they're, they're trying to do, not at all. <laughs> you know, until you begin to look at this against the backdrop of what it's written to dispossess, it really doesn't make any sense. And there's no wonder we have a place called the Ark Experience. How dumb. What a waste of money that could have otherwise gone to feed homeless people. But no, let's build a bottle of a big stupid ark that never existed. Like, what are, like, we've gotten it so backward. Anyways, so in a very brief outline, Genesis 1 to 11 breaks down like this. From 1 1 to 2 3 is creation story 1. And that's usually associated with the priestly source. And we'll talk about these sources in a minute. From Genesis 2 4 to 3 24 is creation story 2. And that's usually associated with the Yahwist or the J-source. Includes this, these are the generations of heaven and of earth, right? That's at the beginning of 2.4. That's a toledot, that word toledot, that's a document, okay? It's a a generation list. And so some scholars are going to say this was actually a separate piece of writing that was put into the Genesis narrative, Okay? From 4 1 to 26, 426, you have Cain and Abel. From 5 1 to 32, again, you have another Toledote from Adam to Noah, which again, like I said, some scholars are going to say this was a, a document that they had. So to preserve it, they put it in their history. From 6 1 to 8, you have 
the prelude to the deluge or the flood, the deluge is kind of what you call it because there are other cultures that deal with it that way. And so that's 6, 1 to 8. And then from 6, 9 to 10, you have this brief little, like, these are the generations of Noah, right? So there's another Toledot there. So you have some, like, all these things that are, like, being stuck into this story. And then from 6, 11 to 22, you have the first flood preparation story. And some people say, what do you mean the first flood preparation story? Well, from 7, 1 to 5, you have the second flood preparation story. In 6, 11 to 22, God says, bring two of every animal, one of male, one of female, bring them on the ark, this is what you're doing. And that's all he says. And then in 7, 1 to 5, it says, well, actually what God said was, bring seven of every clean pair and two of the unclean. So there's some disagreement there of what God said to Noah. Both of those can't possibly be right. Or God changed his mind, and that's a complete mind job for some of us. Then from 7.6 to 9.17, you have the flood story proper. Then from 9.18 to 9.29, you have something known as the cursing of Canaan. Okay, some, some Bibles will be like, Noah plants a vineyard. No, the subtitle there should be the cursing of Canaan so that you get what they're actually trying to do. And then from 10.1 to 32, you have an outline of the earth as it was known, i.e. a map given to us in the form of people groups. Okay? And then in chapter 11, you have the Tower of Babel. Okay? And this is a literary unit, 1 to 11. Okay? This is not several different literary units, even though you can break it down into subheadings and all that. It's all meant to be a piece. And so from the onset, it should be clear to us if we were here or if you weren't here, go back and listen to the few critical readings we did, that a lot of these stories have absolutely no overlap. <laughs> or if they do, there's a massive amount of stitching happening to connect the stories together, and it usually happens in the form of a toledote. It's, oh, this person is attached to this person, and surprise, surprise, the stories on either end are also attached to those people. Okay? Uh, Westerman or Vesterman, but I'm going to say Westerman because I'm a Western man. Ha! <laughs> In this book right here, which is just Genesis 1 to 11, it's his commentary. It's a three-volume thing on Genesis, and it's pretty darn good. Uh, he notes that the entire group of stories from 1 to 11 should probably be known as the deluge or the flood story. And that kind of changes how we're approaching it, right? Because what we've been taught is no Genesis 1 is the creation narrative. And Genesis 2 is the second creation narrative where some filling happens. And Genesis 3 and all this is the fall. And no, this is the flood story. When you open up a Nicholas Sparks book, you don't go to chapter 1 and say, this is, and, and name it something different. It's part of the book. And you can't take it out and say, well, in Sparks chapter 1 it says, no, you've got to read the whole darn book. And that's Genesis 1 to 11 you got to read the book. You know, this is not, here's what happened in a scientific manner. It's in the beginning because there is an end in sight. And that end is the flood. So it's a contained unit, right, of known stories. So in other words, it's not just the bit about Noah in five that leads us to the flood, but everything from the disobedience through the Tower of Babel, is a self-contained quilt of engagement with ancient Near Eastern texts. Okay, and the biggest of those is known as the Enuma Elish, and that's a Babylonian text. Okay? Um, and this is like every scholar that you'll read on the book of Genesis, from the most conservative to the most liberal, will acknowledge that this portion of Genesis is directly engaging the Enuma Elish. Okay, and... About the easiest way to prove this, the first words of, and, and actually what the title is, and this is how they just titled 
documents, right? It doesn't like, you don't find this book and there's like a leather cover that says Enuma Elish. It's a piece of parchment or whatever, or, you know, leather or something, and the first two words are Enuma Elish. And that's, that's in, in our Bibles, the book of Genesis doesn't have a cover that says Genesis. The first word is Bereshit. And so in Hebrew, the book is called Bereshit. And the word Bereshit in Hebrew actually directly engages Enuma Elish. And we don't see that because we like our English translation to say in the beginning. Right? But there's no the there. If it was Bahreshit, there would be a the there but it's be. So all we can say is in or on, right? If you're, if you're, just, just agree that, that be means in or on. So you can't say in the or on the, you just have to say in. And the word reshit, the word rish, rishon is head. And so it's, it's talking about the same idea, you know, in the height, in the top, in the beginning. But it's not the beginning. It's, it's, pantheon idea of gods who live atop a mountain and they are on high creating and high also refers to some kind of primordial time but there's no like they don't have a specific time in mind when they say these words and we think oh yes in the beginning God was creating it's like no 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 Babylon says went on high so we're going to say in the height and they're immediately engaging the Babylonian document you know, the Babylonian tale of creation, which includes the Babylonian tale of the flood. And, you know, those of you who were here for Daniel and heard him read some of this and how the gods swarm the, the sacrifice, like, there's a point that they're making. But what this does along the way is it refutes a lot of our own ideas about Genesis. And so what I want to do... is get us to a point, and I'm going to read off a bunch of things here, that we understand that what Genesis 1 to 11 is, is resistance literature to Babylon. And what it is not is an accurate account of creation when it began and how it happened. Even though they wove some of that in there. Okay? The point of all this is to engage Enuma Elish and to engage the myth of the culture that now holds them captive, right? You don't engage Babylonian mythology from afar for no reason. You engage it because they have you enslaved in exile in their land. And you put it to writing for that reason, because you're not in your land and you need your history. So how do we write our history? Well, we engage the known history. And the known history was that there was a flood. So how do we do it from there? Okay, so here we go. So Genesis 1 to 11 is resistance to the notion that the gods created the world through violence and sexual acts. And this is directly in Enuma Elish. It's also in Egypt's metaphors and creative stories. And it's in most of the cultures, right? The gods create through violence or sex in all other cultures. Okay? And... There is one Egyptian myth that says that Ptah spoke things into existence. So there is some engagement there with another Near Eastern counterpart that Israel has always had to engage, right? Egypt. But opposed to Babylon, whose God creates by murdering one of the other gods, splitting her open and bringing creation from her carcass, and there's also a sexual act in there, you know, the God of Israel doesn't do any of that. He doesn't use violence to beget life. He only needs his words, okay? So it's resistance to the notion that God is created, born, or in some other way fashioned. And obviously we see that. There's no theogony. There's no creation of God in the Old Testament. This isn't totally unique to the, to, to the ancient Near East. Israel's not the only one to have done this, but... In relationship to Babylon, it is unique because Babylon gives Genesis for all their deities. They have when they're born, when they're made, how they're made, how this came to be, right? It's resistance to the idea that evil is from some cosmic outsider but instead comes from humanity, and we see this right away in Genesis, and that is unique, 
right? Where human beings are like, hey, no, the source of all of our problems is the fact that we just can't listen. You know, and they don't say, oh, the devil was in the garden. They say a serpent, and any time they say that an animal has talked, you're supposed to take that metaphorically. It takes 21st century Americans to believe that animals talk in the Bible. <laughs> you know, you don't believe that when you read Shakespeare and something weird happens that is out of the norm, right? No, just the Bible. No, there's a reason they wrote it that way, and you're supposed to take it metaphorically. Because then it opens up to, why did they say this? Because this thing came to her as a whisper on the wind. It hissed. Okay, it wasn't an in-her-face, something that Adam could have reached out and grabbed, serpent. It, it was something like a thought that kind of came to her. So then it's also resistance to the idea that God or the gods require sacrifice for sustenance. And we saw that with the flood story, right? In the biblical flood narrative, Noah offers a sacrifice, and it says, and it was a pleasing odor to the Lord. God liked the smell. Thanks for the incense. Appreciate that. But in the Enuma Elish, they offer a sacrifice, and the gods swarm it because they are starving, because there's no sacrifice going on while they're wiping humanity off the face of the earth. Okay, so it's a direct engagement with the culture of Babylon that says, no, the gods require sacrifice for sustenance, Right? Then again, it is resistance to the idea that it is simply the will of capricious gods that ended life in the flood. They knew the flood happened. Okay, so one of the things that's really hard for me to get across to well-meaning, grace-minded people is that did God really say is probably not the best way to start discussions about the Bible. Right? I mean, and we know why. <laughs> no, but it, it, A, can you even verify that? No. You know, did God really do thus and such? Can you verify that? Sometimes, maybe. You know, maybe not, though. So we don't start there. That's a weird place to start. You know, it's like at every point we're saying, is the Bible historically factual? And the Bible's never said, hey, I'm historically factual. So that'd be like me expecting Gabby to like do things that Gabby doesn't do and acting like I love her by expecting her to do things that she doesn't do. Like, no, no, I just love you. That's why you need to go provide for the whole family while I sit here and play video games. And she's like, no, I don't do that. No, but it's because I love you. You know, you need to go do something that you're not designed for because, I, no, that's stupid, right? But yet when we come to the Bible, we're like, hey, please act like you shouldn't. Like... You don't say you're something, but could you please be that thing? You know, or there's this one cool theological dictionary that says that inerrancy is the belief that something, let's see, let me, let me, let me, something other than God is perfect. You know, and so it's like, okay, how do we, how do we deal with all that? So, yeah, most of the time. So it's not capricious gods that end. See, in, in Enuma Elish, the gods are just kind of like, ah, let's wipe the earth out. And they say, okay, and they do it, because they're kind of tired of all the noise. It's like, well, we created them, and they're really loud. I mean, it's like any parent with toddlers. Like, it's really, really loud. I just want some quiet. Let me flood the house. You know, I mean, this is what the gods of Babylon did. People were loud. They didn't like it. They said, you know what? You're dead. And they saved a couple, and they were like, good, now please offer us a sacrifice, because we're about to die of starvation. But in the biblical flood story, it isn't the will of a capricious God. It's the last resort of a loving deity. Okay, And whether or not we like what God did in the story is irrelevant, Okay, because he did it in the story. And so how do we deal with it, right? It's the last resort of a loving deity that has been, been built up since Genesis 1. You know, immediately there is disobedience and murder and violence and lying and murder and violence, and it builds all the way up. And, it, and right before Noah, now the earth was totally consumed with violence. So they're giving a reason. Whether we agree with it or not, don't care. 
you know, their reason for the flood was that the earth was so consumed with violence that the loving deity had to step in to save us from killing absolutely everything. You know, framed that way, yeah, it's still bad, but it's not quite as bad. And, and it, it definitely speaks to how Israel knew their God. This is a God who does things like that as a last resort because of love. You know, they don't have scientific data that can show them, no, it's actually the moon that moves the tides. And so what are they forced to believe? It's God. What can move the seas but God? You know, well, the moon, but they don't know that. What can burn your skin but God? Well, the sun. You know, but again, they don't know that. And so did God do it? Wrong question. (laughs) How does God interact with them saying he did it? By saying, you know what? I'm never going to punish a living thing for the sin of another again, ever. I mean, there goes your violent atonement theory right out the window in the first few chapters of Genesis. You know, but because we don't like it, (laughs) we dismiss it and we say, oh, that wasn't God. So that means everything that comes after that can't be him either. So you don't get to pull out the good once you've dismissed it for the bad that you think is there. You know, and I've got nothing against Christians who say I can't and they put their Bible away and fine. Jesus' love for you doesn't change. His inclusion of you doesn't change. But the Bible also doesn't change. It still says what it says. And sometimes people are going to have questions. And that's kind of what I like to deal with is those questions. You know, and we've all got the friend who's like, well, yeah, but what about like, and they want to go back and look. And just saying, oh, well, that wasn't God, that doesn't fly. Right? Like, it works for us. Internally, we can say, you know what, I know Jesus to be the revelation of the Father, and that doesn't look like the Father, so I'm fine with saying God doesn't kill people. But the problem is is that the text still says he did. So, you know, we, we don't just get to toss it, and it's really hard to deal with. But when we begin to read it as resistance literature, it does. It changes everything. So again, this this deity is a God who just can't allow humanity to not only wipe itself off the face of the earth, but all the animal life as well. The sacrifice was rampant. You know, everything to appease the gods requires blood. And in, in that respect, the sacrifices of the Old Testament are extremely limiting. They're actually very protective of the animal life around Israel. You're only allowed to sacrifice from things that there's a lot of, and you're only allowed to sacrifice a few things. You can't just bring whatever you want. You know, it's like, okay, there's a lot of cattle, fine, bring a cow, whatever. There's a lot of sheep, okay, bring a sheep. There's a ton of birds, all right. Like, you can't, like, go grab a giraffe from Ethiopia. You know, I'm serious. I mean, like, there, there are limits to this, and you can't grab a pig, right? You can't, and it's, so it's, it's, yes, it's weird, and it's kind of hard to wrap our brains around, but it's resistance to what's going on in the culture around them continually. Oops. Then you close your notes, and now you don't know where you are. So the creation narratives in Genesis resist the notion of a seven-day work week. Amen, hallelujah, praise Jesus. No, but why would that be important to resist unless you were at one point slaves who needed to resist the idea that the only way that you could live and get things done was with a seven-day work week, you know, and enforced labor. No, we take a day off. What? Because it says so. Because God did. And they're like, no. Yeah, well, we do. You know, it's resistance. It's a slap in the face of Babylon to say, we're not going to work for you on that day. And Egypt. And then the narrative itself resists the notion that the flood was in any respect global, as we have come to understand that word today. Okay? And, and what, do, what do I mean by that? No one had been to space and seen that the earth was not a flat disk, sorry, flat earth societies, it's seen that the earth was not a disk on pillars with water above and water below. It's a globe. Okay? Nobody had seen that yet, though. And so when they say the earth is flooded, that's based in the notion that the earth is a flat field sitting on pillars. And if everything you can see, as far as you can see, even the mountains that you know are covered in water, then everything must be, right? 
But then the problem is, is that they give us the boundaries of everything. You know, they call it the table of nations. And we think, oh, well, here's, here's a bunch of people that I don't need to know. But actually, it's the known world, which means when they say the world was flooded, this is probably the boundaries of, of what they would consider their world. How many were here when Colorado flooded a few years back? You know, certain parts of Colorado, if you didn't have the news and you just kind of lived there, you would be like, oh my God, the earth is flooded. As far as I can see, it's covered in water. And this shouldn't be shocking to us. You know, but the thing that really upsets all this is the fact that both China and Egypt have older documents. And in no way do they ever talk about a flood in their areas. At least if there are any, not at the same time as the Mesopotamian flood. Okay, so, so that means that older cultures that don't reference something sort of make it impossible for it to have been global in the sense that we think about global. You know, perhaps the fact that globe isn't a word in biblical Hebrew should cue us in <laughs> on the fact that they don't mean global. The outlining of nations of the earth is both all-inclusive to them, meaning this is everybody that we know exists. And it's to the ends of the earth, meaning that's as far as we know that people exist. Okay? And then I already said that. And then Genesis 1 to 11 resists any notion of either mosaic authorship, and I don't mean like little tiny tiles, I mean the guy Moses. Because there's absolutely no way he penned his own death in Deuteronomy. Okay, so at a minimum, you got to say there's something kind of suspect here. Okay? There are other things, and this is where you could get into some big, big heated debates, and you, you need a scholar, really, to walk you through all this. But it also resists the notion of the documentary hypothesis. And here, let's just explain this, because I know that there are some in this church that have heard it, and there are some who haven't, and sometimes the ones who have are still very skittish about this. But in essence, there was a guy named Julius Wellhausen, and he was, guess what, a German scholar. And he approached the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, at a time when everybody believed that Moses had written all of them. And he said, now wait a second, this doesn't look right. And based in some of the stuff that we've talked about, the fact that there are different pieces stitched together and very visibly different pieces stitched together and pieces from different time periods put together, he said, well, it must be that there are sources here. Schools of thought or actual documents from different schools or different you know, people groups that were somehow stitched together and used as the material for the various authors of the Pentateuch. Okay? And what he did was he grouped these down into four groups, J, E, P, and D. There's not going to be a test on this. Okay, J stands for Yahwist because in German, Yah is J, right? And E stands for Eloist, which is the Elohim guy. P stands for the priestly source. And D stands for the Deuteronomist, okay? They're pretty self-explanatory. And if you really get down deep into it, it's kind of hard to deny it, that, that there's at least multiple authors at work here, Okay? Now, since Wellhausen's suggestions, things have been widely, widely critiqued. They've been widely expanded and taken apart. But the general idea that there are sources to the first five books of the Bible still actually holds. And no one's been able to fully disprove it. Now, things like these Toledot and something you'll, you'll read in Numbers um, that you may probably have just glossed over if you've ever even read the book of Numbers. There's a particular verse that says, as it is written in the scroll of the wars of Yahweh. What is that? What is the scroll of the wars of Yahweh? It's an outside source. And it's one that we don't have anymore. But it's the author recognizing that he's using source material. 
Okay? So if we don't think there is source material being brought into the Bible, we're wrong. You know, and it's, and it's demonstrably false just in the Bible. You know, I don't, I don't need to be a scholar to say, as it is written in the scroll of the wars of Yahweh, tells me about a document that I don't have. Okay. So much of Wellhausen's work was rightly crit- criticized and critiqued for its kind of latent and not so latent anti-Semitism. Meaning, he stood at one end of history and decided that the progression that Judaism came through was somehow negative, so they evolved from, from strict benevolent monotheism into the cult of Judaism, is basically what he called it. And he even says this line, the law came in between. And he's being a good Lutheran German anti-Semite. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. And he's saying, oh yeah, see, the, the Jews that we know today, the rabbinic Jews that are based in the Judaism that we see emerging in the Bible... Like, they're, a, they're a, a de-evolution state of what Israel was, okay? And so a lot of his theory then is plagued with that, but it doesn't negate this stuff. So I say that to say, don't go look up Julius Wellhausen. You don't really need to read his work, but you got to recognize where it came from, you know? Now, having said that <laughs> about Wellhausen and about what he's doing, and this will be important you know, in a few minutes. There are a lot of scholars, this guy included, who critique what he brought in a very good way. So we're going to read some stuff from Westermann, who's another good Vesta, you know, German guy. Um, but we'll get there in just a second. So this theory then kind of helps us understand why we've got two creation stories. Why we've got two flood introduction stories. Do you bring two? Do you bring seven and two? You know, well, how about we recognize that the chronicler, compiler, editorial school, however we want to frame this, because there's no author, okay? The editorial school that kind of compiled all this so valued their tradition and so understood it to be the word of God in, in the sense that we've heard that, you know, that they included both because they didn't want to get it wrong. And what is that? Well, that kind of like tips us to the fact that there is more than one singular people group who has come together to be the nation of Israel. And so they've preserved their stories in a way that lets them kind of interplay with each other and bounce off of each other and be like part of the whole. And they don't offer any commentary and they don't say, well... That one was right and this one's wrong and it's just they're both there. Is it two or is it seven? You know, we don't get the answer. Okay, so let's read this guy real quick. Uh, and this is a little bit longer quote, but I want to read it because I think he kind of gives a smackdown to Dr. Wellhausen. And I'm going to keep it to the shorter part. He says, The fact that an oral stage of tradition preceded the written is not enough on which to base a traditional historical explanation. And that's kind of the, the moniker he's given to Wellhausen's theory. The, the traditio historical method. You know. So when you hear that, just think JEPD. Wellhausen, Dillman, and others could say this without it having any influence on their exegetical method. They had not seen the methodological relevance of taking over older traditions, meaning the author is not just stitching sources together. He's taking over a tradition of interpretation and of working with these texts. Okay, so it's not, not just let's stitch it all together and, and you know, oppress people for 5,000 years with this story. It's, no, there's a tradition of interpretation and of working with these texts and allowing them to work with the texts around them, and this is being plugged in. They understood the traditions as raw material, which the author worked over and handled like potter handles clay, they meaning these two scholars. They did not see that the old traditions, like the flood narrative, had a life and history of their own before the biblical author took them over, and that he had great respect for them and wanted them to live on in his work. Okay, And this kind of means that sometimes when we see things that we don't like, they're there for a reason. 
You know, this was the tradition, so they left it alone. They didn't change it. And it, it's ugly, you know? And we sanitize our history, right? What's funny to me is, is, and we'll get back to this in just a second, Americans who don't like the violence of the Bible and at the same time don't like historical revisionism. It's like, well, which one do you not like? Do you want the history revised or do you want it to be what it was? You know, because what it was is always ugly. Always. It is always violent. It is always ugly. The more violent, the more true. I'm sorry, that's just human history. You know, that's when everything gets sanitized and it's like, well, you know, it was just, we were just fighting back and they were insurgents. Like Star Wars taught us what to believe when an empire calls someone a rebel. Okay, we know this. <laughs> yes, right? Like, it shouldn't be too difficult for us. This is, a, it's, it's a universal truth. When an empire calls someone a rebel, that's usually the right person. Right? Jesus was a rebel. But not to Judaism. Okay, anyways, back to this. They did not see that the old traditions, like the flood narrative had a life and history of their own before the biblical author took them over, and that he had great respect for them and wanted them to live on in his work. He did not regard them as raw material, but as the word of the fathers, which he had to pass on. The stage that preceded the fixation in writing claims the same basic importance for the formulation of the Pentateuch as does the writing stage. The crucial point is that the written version is the result of an unbroken line from its beginnings in word of mouth through many stages of oral tradition right up to its fixation in writing. The individual passages thereby through context that were already there before its insertion into the written whole. Sorry, it passes thereby through context that were already there. The, the traditio historical method, therefore, requires an explanation that has equal regard for the oral and the written stages of the formation of the Pentateuch. So right there, what he's basically saying is the flood story in itself stands opposed to the idea of multiple source theory in the sense that it was presented. That doesn't matter to 90% of you, okay? But it's going to matter to people who watch this online and are familiar with source theory. And what, what, what Vesterman is saying, and, and I tend to agree, is that Genesis 1 to 11 is the flood story. It is not a, co like a, a conglomeration of sources. It's the flood story. And yes, maybe he supplemented and this is a new other theory that's out, supplementary hypothesis, maybe he supplemented his material a bit to fill out the flood story. Okay, But the tradition is the flood story. So that means when we go to Genesis 1, we're not reading in the beginning the creation of heaven and earth. We're reading the flood story. Okay, so this resistance goes even further as Genesis 1 to 11 resists the notion that the same people chosen by God could have possibly come through the group of local mutts known to them as Canaanites. Right? Even as far as to assert their, their tribal nom, whatever you call him, Canaan to be the product of incest between drunk mother and son. Like, it couldn't be plainer that that's what they're doing. They are cursing Canaan because Canaan is the land that they, and they refuse to acknowledge that they come from Canaan. Does this historically mean that that's true? No, actually we know that the people that are now called Israel emerged from Canaan. I mean, it just, that just is what it is. And you can't do anything with that other than the scholars that I tend to side with who say, that actually probably the Apiru were a group of people that were somewhat like outcasts that lived in the valley below the fertile field, the fertile hills. And maybe this group of outcasts made a god named Yahweh, and he revealed himself as the god of the outcast. That sounds like Jesus. And so that's where we have landed. We've read Genesis 1 to 10. We've talked about all these stories, and we haven't even really gone in depth on most of them. You could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks just on Genesis 1. Okay, and all the stuff that's in there and what's all being said and how the, the language is working. And I mean, there are, there are direct assaults on Babylonian gods in Genesis 1. And if you read Hebrew, it, it's there. And you just see it, and it's like, oh, 
you know. But now we're at the flood has subsided and people have gone out, covered the, the earth, <laughs> covered the earth, covered their earth. And we are at a place where there is suddenly something very, very wrong. Okay. It says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. That's interesting. Because obviously if they have one language, they have the same words except for the fact that Semitic languages are all tied together and they don't all use the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So this is an acknowledgement that Mesopotamia is the cradle of life to them. This is where life began for them. And they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. This is an acknowledgement <laughs> of Akkadian ziggurat construction. The bricks had to be burned thoroughly. Okay, There's something about the curing, and I'm not the archaeological side, but it has to do with the construction. And so this phrase is meant to stir up in their mind a, the towers that they know Okay, from Babylon. Shinar is in Babylon. We'll find this out in a minute. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Then Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower that humankind was building. Now, there have been many a sermon preached on, oh, well, the, you, you shouldn't, you know, who can ascend? You shouldn't, like, this has nothing to do with it. They're not trying to go up to where God is. Humans can't go that high. They know this. Okay, that's why the author makes it a point in the next verse to say, and Yahweh came down, meaning like literally down, because they weren't going to be able to go all the way up, period. Okay, so just up to the heavens is just, they just wanted to build it very tall. Okay, because tall towers say, look at our might. So Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower that humankind was building kind of also implies that Yahweh is not an all-seeing, omnipresent deity. He's somewhere else. And he doesn't know what they're doing. So he comes down to see what they're doing. And Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people with one language. Again, like this is, surprises him. Wait, wait, they all have one language? How did that happen? This is only, beginning of, this is only the beginning of what they will do. So now nothing that they intend to do will be impossible for them. Why? No reason. We can get religious about it and be like, oh, it's because they were unified. That's not there. It just seems like an irrational fear. It seems like this deity is, is really, really concerned, right, that people are going to, like, trespass on his property. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other's language. Who is he talking to? This is not a royal we, okay? King's English hadn't been invented yet. And in the Hebrew, it is a plural verb, let us go. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the pantheon of Canaanite deities, okay? I know that hits us like a ton, like, oh, he's talking to other gods? Yes. In the story, the high god of Israel is talking to the other gods that he rules over. There are other gods. It's just that he is Big Papa. Right? You don't, like, Yahweh is the guy. And then there's these other deities. Okay? Baal was not thought to be a fake god. It's way later in Israel's history that they start to crit criticize people's notions that their gods aren't real and stuff like that. But in this early formative phases of Israel, like, they very, very, very realistically believe in multiple gods, but they worship one. Okay, it's called monolatry. It's the worship of one god while acknowledging that others exist. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. 
For there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The notion that the name Babel is right there has actually been challenged by a number of scholars, and it just should be called confusion. Okay? That's too much of a, an English link. The Hebrew word is Balal, it's not Babel. I mean, they have a word for Babel, and they don't, you know, they use it when they're talking about Babylon. But then there are other ones that are going to disagree with that. So what are you going to do? So then you have this huge list again. All these descendants, and all, I mean, we're not going to read through all of them, right? This is again an outlying of the people groups that they knew to have existed. Okay, it's little more than that. It's a table of nations. It's a, here's what we know our land to be, and this is why they all speak different languages, is because at one point, they were all getting together to do something, and Yahweh was concerned about that something. Gerhard von Rott, which I didn't bring his with me, but his commentary on Genesis, he makes a pretty, pretty cool point that you could read this as resistance to the notion that gathering together for the purposes of bearing arms against other people is being challenged here. Like it's, they're gathering together to assert military might. And so God scatters them because violence has already been taken care of. You know, there's already been punishment for violence. And if you're going to gather back together and do it again, that's an issue. So now let's confuse their speech. So what's being said about humanity here? We have a tendency to be violent. Is that false? No, I don't think that anybody would deny that for a second. And then, of course, what you've got, going all the way down to the end of, of chapter 11, uh, let's just go to... Let's, let's start with 27, because this is where it gets real important if you're a Jew. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Now, what have we learned when you, when you hear? Now, these are the generations of, it's the word Toledot. Okay? Which means document. It doesn't mean document. It means this is probably or was at some point a document of its own. These are the generations of, it's like a family tree. Right? You, you prepare those, and you don't like stick it in your Bible and say, okay, now this is a part of my Bible. But they kind of did, because they're in exile, and they have to connect their people groups. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Poor Lot. Boy, we're going to meet him in a few weeks, and that guy just doesn't get a good rap. And Haran died in the presence of Terah, his father, in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, there's a big problem here because there is no such place. Okay, there is no Ur of the Chaldeans, and there were no Chaldeans at the time that this is supposed to have taken place. That's a much later group. So obviously, this is an author writing later, and he just says, it's Ur of the Chaldeans, kind of like thinking, oh, it's always been known as the Chaldeans. No, not really. And the Septuagint actually says in the city of the Chaldeans. So they like change the word. So it, you know, it, it, this is kind of an interesting thing. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of the wife of Abram was Sarai, and the name of the wife of Nahor was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, the wife of Abram, his son, and went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they went to Haran and settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, who is Abram for Jewish people or for Muslims? Yeah, like he's like the father of everyone, right? And he goes into Canaan. And everybody comes from people that are in Canaan. And yet they deny Canaanite origins. You know, it's not that difficult to see what they're resisting. They're resisting the association with this group of people that they feel like they have justification to wipe out. Okay? So, we end this with this newly constructed tower 
that people have, at least if you're going to side with this guy who conveniently sides with me, and say that it's about this assembling to make war idea that God is kind of with. It's like, no, we're going to confuse their speech because we're not assembling for that reason. You know, and it, it kind of seems like that is what's in sight when they write this as the close of the resistance literature, right? I mean, not that there's not any more. There is certainly more, but of this piece of resistance, from the beginning to the very end of it, even the end, Tower of Babel end, it's, it's about the human propensity to violence and how that leads us to destruction. I don't think we need to disagree with that. I don't think we need to say, well, but Jesus, Jesus would agree that the tendency of humanity is violent. And he would agree that if we remain violent, it has the ability to destroy us. He says, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. You know, it's, I got myself in trouble last week because I said I don't think Jesus was a pacifist. And all I really meant was modern category, you know, fit this mode or you're not a Christian, but I got kind of taken apart for it. But I do believe that the kingdom is peace, okay? And I do believe that when we allow the Bible to say what it says, it's gross, it's offensive, but it gives us, like, it kind of hits us between the eyes. We have a tendency toward violence. I might not personally. I personally may have overcome my own tendency. No, I'm just saying, and you, you might have personally, you might be someone who, you know what, you're not going to respond violently. Cool, that doesn't change humanity. It's sad, but it's true. Does that make them not loved? No. You know, does... Does it make us not okay with God? No, it just, this is the human condition, folks. You're not born a sinner. You're born prone to violence. And we can overcome it. So then the point of, and this is, this is in summary, so I have eight pages to close out. Genesis 1 to 11 is not the record of how God created and when. That would be silly. But we could title it, The name above all names is our God, and everything we know to have happened has happened by his hand. That's a long title. Because this is what Israel does. Their God is the name. They call him Hashem, and those words in Hebrew mean the name. They won't say Yahweh. They say Hashem, or they say Adonai, my Lord. Right? They don't. And, and so this idea is there, and they're asserting, look, whatever happened, we know there was a flood, we're not going to argue with that. That'd be like us saying, look, Katrina didn't really happen. Well, of course it did. We know it happened. So we're not going to come out with a story that says, well, Katrina didn't happen. We're going to come out with a story that says, Katrina happened, and here's why. For us, it's because the moon moved, and you know the weather patterns were such, and there was a high-pressure front and a low-pressure front, and we know how this works. For them, it was because God made it. Why did a flood happen? Probably because a high-pressure flood hit a low-pressure flood and it started draining and there's not a lot of good drainage in the Middle East and things flooded. You know, but they don't know that, so God did it. So what this says for us is, A, yeah, there probably was a flood. What it also says for us is Israel doesn't deny that there was a flood. What it also says for us is that their God is so sovereign that even, even stuff that happens that we might think is bad, they look at it as good because he has chosen them, and so anything that happens can't have happened outside of his hand. Man, that we would have that kind of faith. Right? But we don't. We run from absolutely everything that we don't like. And we say, I rebuke you, Satan! And like, you'll notice who isn't in play in Genesis 1-11? to yeah, Satan, he's nowhere. So for the most part, the point of all of this is to get to be etiological, to, to tell the reader, which includes us, but also the initial reader, there's a reason. They didn't write this. Like, I don't, I've never written an email thinking in 2,000 years, someone is going to read this. And they didn't either. They didn't write their stories and think, in 5,000 years, a bunch of white people are going to get together and they're going to be really offended about our violent God. 
No, that's not how it works, right? They were explaining why we find ourselves in the state we're in today, where today is living in exile in Babylon. Okay? Now, that's a long time dismissed from when all this stuff was supposed to have happened. Long time. Three to 5,000 years by the conservative estimates. Okay? It's after certain things that we read later in the Bible. You know, Ezekiel is living in the Babylonian exile. And the violence and destruction and sieging of Jerusalem that he talks about is really kind of the framework we need to have when we go back and read Genesis 1 through 11. Okay? They've done something. If you read Psalm 137, you have the most like crucified verse, no pun intended, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. It says, happy is the man who dashes your infant's heads against the rocks. And everybody's like, oh, I don't like that verse, and, but read the whole chapter, okay? We're in prison in Babylon, is how it starts, and they come to them and they say, sing to us one of your Yahweh songs. So the songwriter says, all right, I got one for you. And he says, happy is the one that does to you what you've done to us. Happy is the one who dashes your infant's heads against the rocks. He's mourning you know what we have zero record of Israel ever doing? Dashing infants' heads against the rocks. They were not retributive in that right. They left it off the table. They just wrote, we're in such pain over what you've done. And this word doesn't mean infants like Ryder. It means infants like can't move on their own, still nursing infants. And they were smashed against rocks in front of the mothers. And so this author is pouring out his heart and we think, oh, it's such a nasty verse. Yeah, it is, because a nasty thing happened to them. And they asked God for help. And they said, you know what? Happy is the one who does it on our behalf. Because they're not going to do it. They're not that evil. You know, even in reply to that kind of evil being done to them, they're not going to do it. That ugly passage just becomes beautiful if we just let it say what it says and deal with it. Okay, so finally... And I mean finally. <laughs> the resistance continues in that humanity is created in the direct, expressed, full image and likeness of the deity. Right? This isn't some standoff God who has said, let's see what happens. You know, the gods of Egypt and some of the gods of Babylon, they use their own reproductive fluids to create. And it was just kind of like they flung it out into the universe and let's see what happens. But this God makes something out of himself. He speaks it. His words become the things that we live on. This is out of himself. This is not God creating out of nothing. He's not like picking something out of nothing and saying that's the earth. He's saying light and all of a sudden, poof, Right? So this is different. This is opposed to the, to the old Catholic notion that God created out of nothing because that says the deepest truth about you is nothing. But this God creates out of himself and when he says it, it is, so that means that you are the deepest truth about you according to Genesis is God, not nothing. Well, that changes the thing a bit. Man, now we can start doing some theology. Because now we don't got to worry about all that other garbage that we've been taught about us because we know, no, no, no. The oldest story that I've got says that the deepest truth about me is God. Let's read Westerman here and then I'm going to close out. And there are two things that are actually really cool here. He says, there is no sign of this in the God-human relationship in the primeval story. And what he means here by this, I'm just trying to summarize about three paragraphs quickly. 
is an encounter, he says, an encounter with a living God that gives rise to a continuous historical exchange. Okay, and this is the God of Israel, right? Like it's, there's this revelation and then there's obedience and service and revelation and it's this idea of, of interplay and exchange. He says, there's no sign of this in the God-human relationship in the primeval story, nor is there any sign of the separation of the spheres of existence that make up the historical state. Every area of existence is related alike directly to God. There is no separation between the sacred and the profane. In essence, there is no religious area of existence. Consequently, there is no such thing as revelation. In the primeval event, it neither occurs, it occurs neither as an encounter in history nor as an encounter with the Holy One. God and his people are not at such a distance from each other that God has to reveal himself. You hear that? Man, that's big. Genesis 1 to 11 presents a God of no distance. If the primeval event is not to be understood as revelation, if there is nothing in the text that stemmed from revelation or understands itself as such, then the old controversy between revelatio generalis and revelatio specialis is no more. That's a scholarly debate about general versus special revelation. But the notion is that there, there's none of that. There is only this God who is near. Period. He is near. You know, one of the, one of the stories or one of the themes of the Hebrew Bible that I think is, is infinitely important is the, is the theme. You good? Mama. <laughs> is the theme of, of image and likeness, right? That's important back there. And the theme of closeness. But there's another theme that's back there that we don't like, and especially if we live in the modern, like, no one goes to hell. Like, and look, I believe that, but I'm just, I'm just saying, like, we tend to put our own beliefs back on what the Hebrew Bible actually says. And the problem is, is that the God of Genesis 1 and 2 exiles Adam and Eve. He does. And there's no way around that. And you can't, you can't preach yourself into an area where, where God didn't exile them. And, and he continues in that vein, right? He sends Jonah off in exile. You Fine, go do that. He sends Israel into exile in their text. I'm not like, again, well, did God really do that? Like, don't ask that question. Because in the text, he does. But also what happens is this God who the, the later theologians have come to call the co-suffering, you know, others-centered love, like that God exists in that God who exiles. Why? Because he doesn't leave them in exile. He goes out with them. He lives as an exile, in exile with his exiles. Have they been exiled? No, that means no. <laughs> You know, we don't like the notion that God kicked him out of Eden. Well, A, it's not supposed to be literal, so quit saying that. But B, I like it. Because there's that hint of like, oh man, this is offensive to everybody. Because the grace people don't like that he exiles, and the legalists don't like that he goes out with them in exile. And it like hits both fronts. And that's what it should do, because that's like the double-edged motif, right? Like it's going to hit both sides when it goes in. There's no way that it can't. And so this God of Genesis 1 to 11 and later Hebrew Bible stuff, and we'll talk about progressive revelation later on and why that's important, but this God exiles people, but he doesn't leave them in exile alone. He says, you've made your bed in Sheol, so I bunked with you. Right? We know that from David. David. Even if I make my bed and shield, what does that mean? Normally it's you who makes it, but even if I make it, you're there with me. Because if you're making it for me, obviously you're there. But if I make it for myself, well, that question is there. It, well, am, am I alone? No. Even if I make my bed there, you're there with me. Whether you send me to exile or I send me to exile, you live as an exile with me in exile. Man, that's incarnational. 
And it's, yeah, it's offensive to our grace sensibilities. We don't like anger and punishment and wrath and judgment. And you will. When you learn how to read it right, you will. Because it's not, you don't really like anger, but it's just you understand what's going on. I, mean, I was talking to Gabby this morning, and, and this, if this hasn't kind of like helped you to just like, when you go read, especially, I mean, most of the problems that people have with the Old Testament, with the Hebrew Bible, comes from Genesis 1 to 11, Leviticus, Joshua, and a few other like scattered verses. You know, there's really not an overwhelming amount of troublesome texts in the Hebrew Bible. It's just the ones that are, are like extra troublesome. You know, because in Joshua, Yahweh says, kill them all, babies and all. You know, and we'll deal with that when we get there. Long, long time from now. Yeah. But there is a way to deal with it. And the way to deal with it isn't to say, oh, well, it's wrong. You know, we got to learn how to read. And we have to learn why to read. And we have to learn what to read. And a lot of times the what is outside the Bible. What I would say in closing is if any of you doubt <laughs> that Genesis 1 to 11 is a direct engagement of Enuma Elish, please go online and read it. It's free. And there's English translations of it out there for free. Some are better than others, but the points are still there. And you'll start to see all these points, and you'll be like, oh, you know, now we get to study. Because now, what is Israel actually saying about their God? 